our panel of activists and volunteers. Um, we're gonna, for, at first I'd like to, we're gonna start it in a little bit with a documentary done, but I wanna introduce our panel first. Um, we have Dr. Asim Mirza, I'm sorry, he's here. Um, you have their bios in front of you, and we also have his son Hamza Mirza, who we're gonna be viewing his documentary in a couple of minutes, and we are wonderful, uh, very happy to have Dr. N. Bakshiri, who have joined us today to talk about their experiences um, going back to Pakistan to help the children there, particularly um, orphans in, the, in their orphanage. Um, just show of hands, how many of you already do some kind of volunteering in your community, neighborhood, whether it's giving canned donations or anything like that, working with a uh, food pantry? So we do have a couple people. Great, so hopefully by the end of this panel, perhaps you will take away with you maybe different ways that you can get involved, right? Malala, one of my favorite quotes from her is, you know, it's one girl, one book, one pen can make a difference, and you can make a difference. Even if it's, we're doing a lot of food drives around campus, even if it's just bringing canned goods and dropping it off in a box, you did something, right? It's better than just watching all some of the stuff go on in the news and you just say, oh, that's so sad, and it's just too bad, and then changing the channel, right? We all need to make a difference. So without further ado, we're gonna start the small, do the, the, uh, just a small clip of the documentary that um, Hamza has put together, uh, went back to Pakistan and filmed for us. So is that it? I wanna thank you for that, that's extraordinary. Um, <coughs> So now that we have our full panel, I'd like you all to just, um, again, introduce yourselves, tell a little bit about um, the work that you do. Starting with you, Hamza, talk to us a little about how you, um, where you go to school and how you, you started with this documentary. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm a sophomore at the University of Connecticut. I've started this work at a pretty young age. I'm lucky enough to have the grandmother and the parents that I do. I spent a lot of summers in Pakistan working with my grandmother. When there was an earthquake in 05, I was with my, brother, my, uh, my grandmother. We were doing relief there. I spent plenty of summers working with my grandmother's organization, IDSP. I spent a good amount, we, me and my father, we went to Pakistan last winter, did a medical camp there where he actually just came back from doing a second one. So I've been pretty involved with doing work in Pakistan and service has always been a pretty big issue in my own life. I worked with an uh, organization at Brown called International, um, International in Ch Exchange, and we would do work with the family homeless shelter in Providence and working with recent immigrants and helping them assimilate into life in Rhode Island. I went to, a, I should probably, I went to LaSalle Academy in Providence, so I've lived in Rhode Island most of my life. And now that UConn, I'm doing my own work there. I'm fundraising, I actually had a fundraiser last night where we raised money f to adopt an orphan for all intents and purposes. And I'm showcasing this movie at UConn next semester, hopefully raise more money for them. Um, I'm just putting myself in positions so that after school, after grad school, I can continue doing service work and do as much for the people in Pakistan that I've met and the world itself. That's me. Um, shalom. Good afternoon. Namaste. Salam. Peace be upon all of you. My name is Asim Mirza. I'm born and raised in Pakistan, Karachi, uh, a country of officially 180 million people. It's probably up to 200 by now. Um, I'm a physician. I work at Kent Hospital in Warwick, Rhode Island. I'm an intensivist. Uh, I did my critical care fellowship at Brown University at Rhode Island Hospital. And uh, between me and my wife, who is more of an enthusiast in welfare, social welfare development, with her support, um, I, for the past few years, have been able to fundraise enough to go once, if not twice a year, to rural Pakistan, where I take medical camps. I hire physicians. I take midwives from my mother's organization. 
um, pharmacist. We hold medical camps, treat as much as we can, teach as much as we can in a couple of weeks. I just came back yesterday morning. We saw about 4,000 patients in the area where slightly off where Malala's land is. Uh, so it was, it was interesting. So we'll talk more about it, but that's a little bit of my background. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kuratulain Bakhtiari. Uh, you, was, you must be wondering if I am the mother and the grandmother. So the difference in the name, because I kept my maiden name, my father's name, uh, and I did not change after my marriage. Um, uh, I have been uh, raised and brought up in a refugee camp in Karachi. Uh, when the subcontinent, Indian subcontinent in 47 was divided. And that's a time when my parents uh, were uh, sheltered like millions of refugees in Karachi. And I happened to uh, born there and my first 12 years of my life was in that camp. And that is where I learned all the community living and sharing and caring and how to be happy with nothing even if you have no water, no home, uh, no food, or every day is unpredictable whether you'll get, it, get uh, your next meal or not, whether there's be water or not, whether you'll find the house back home after wandering in, in, in those camps, I remember. So, but still, uh, in a way that those 12 years taught me how to uh, be contented and happy and, st and be optimistic because everything was being created in a refugee camp. You know, if any of you have that experience, everything is being created out of nothing. So that became like a second nature of mine. And it was carried on. I was married at 16, naturally, in, the, in those days, traditional marriage. 21, I had three kids. And uh, I continued with my education. But uh, my, I was all the time drawn to the communities. And once I did my master's in social work, then I went off to, into community development. And to date, I am a community activist and a community educationalist. Uh, I did my PhD in the same subject from England and built a model of how to build methodologies for change with the people and how to then affect the policies of the country. And doing that and practicing that from Karachi to across the country. And finally, for the last 16 years, I'm in Balochistan, a province which is neighboring Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, a very tough place to be, but a beautiful place. And people are just wonderful. Very misunderstood by the country and internationally. But uh, uh, the lessons are that we need to know more before, with our own selves, uh, we need to really find out more before we really take what media tells us, what the secondary or third sources tell us. It is all so, um, I, I must say, so different than what the reality is. Uh, later, if then I'll come back for more on my work, what I do. Hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace be upon you. My name is Muhammad Akhtar. Uh, I'm a practicing physician uh, in Rhode Island. I do practice medicine um, as well as uh, hematology and oncology. And I uh, was born and raised uh, in Pakistan. I went to medical school in Pakistan. And I came to the United States in 1991. And I went to my residency in New Jersey. Um, and then I did my fellowship in, in uh, cancer medicine in, uh, at Brown University. So now I practice in a private practice, uh, and I also go to a hospital-based medicine as well. And I'm very lucky to sit next to Dr. Kurotaran Bakhtiari. She's a giant among all of us. Mm -hmm. You take my word for it. And I'm really honored and lucky to be sitting next to her. I, I don't give myself much credit of doing the work I do because I take it as God's work. And uh, just to be here and explain what I do. And I started, uh, when, when I started practice, I just started, you know, like everybody else, the purpose was to see more patients and accumulate uh, more money. 
you know, and more things, we married and kids and all that. And then after the floods in 2010 in Pakistan, it just came to me, if it was building upon me, so, and I needed to help, so, so I went right after that, uh, and we, we had a little meeting. We said, let's, you know, we gotta do something. Um, so we thought, we thought we could connect $5,000, it'd be great. So when we, the, the, the devastation was such huge uh, that uh, by the time we sat down, we have about $65,000, uh, you know, calculated about $65,000 uh, during that effort. So, um, and so I said, I will go and see. And uh, so I, uh, I saw the devastation and the children, um, and they looked no different than my own kids. So, so that gave me incentive to do something for the kids. So we, uh, uh, initially I brought $70,000 and we distributed among different work people were doing. And let me just uh, rephrase everything first. Uh, Pakistan is not a country to look for handouts. You know, it's a beautiful country, uh, pe uh, beautiful people, self-reliant people, and, uh, and that's what makes me go back because they really don't want our help. But, uh, but I think at the same time, they, uh, you know, with a little enrichment, they do, they'll do much better. So, um, so anyway, uh, in January of 2011, I went there and I went to this area of where the floods were and the children were walking around with no houses, barely clothes on their back. And I remember uh, the temperature was zero degree that day because the car registered it. So we decided to build houses for, for the kids. So I said, well, you know, we took a small community um, and uh, in a, um, in the Muzaffargarh area, which is about six hours drive from my house in, uh, in Pakistan. So, um, and that was the nearest place I get to where the flood devastation was. We saw a few places, we like one area, we, we said we're gonna build houses. Initially thought I'll just give the money out and let them build it, but then the people who were from there said, no, no, you gotta actually build it if it needs to happen, you have to do it. So we eventually got a team together and we built 27 houses. So those houses, those, so that completed that small village. So that, that there are about uh, you know, 300 people kind of accumulating in those 27 houses. So that gave me a taste uh, and empowered me to really, I can do this, you know, I, it can be done even from living here and then going there. So, so I've been traveling uh, uh, twice a year uh, to Pakistan uh, I mean, my dad is there, so I not only just go there for work, but also go to see my family. So, and then I also do work. So, the, uh, so I built a foundation um, which is ba named under my, uh, on my mother's name, Rashida Salim Foundation for Human Development, and we registered in Rhode Island, and uh, we also have now a 501c3 organization uh, title for that. So the purpose of the organization, what, what I do now over there is, basically uh, concentrate on schools, and we also have an orphanage that we work for. So the, um, uh, so we, you know, we basically enrich the schools. The schools, I take the schools that are already there. Uh, just, uh, like for example, one school I went, uh, that was next to the flood affected uh, houses that we, uh, the houses that we built for the village, and was right in that, the children go there, and it was in bad shape. You know, the children were sitting on the floor, and they were just basically just very, very poor environment. So I asked the teacher, what do you actually need? He said, well, first thing we need is desk, and I agree with that, because that really lifts the kids up. So we said, okay, so they were, um, they were about 90 kids, um, I don't remember exactly, but around that. So we said, how many? So we sent them 60, by the time I left, but my friends, you know, we made it happen, 60-some 60, uh, 60 desks we sent them. That completed the seating arrangement. And when, we went, when I went back uh, six months later, it was a complete transformation of the school by just having the desks. Complete transformation. So, uh, but then we started to build a library, then I took additional schools close to where I live, um, and we also have an orphanage 
uh, in Faisalabad where my family is currently residing. So, so we work on schools and orphanage. And uh, I'm happy to do the work. And that's why I don't take much credit for myself for that because it's not really that important. So, uh, and that's with that question. Thank you. Going back to you, Hamza, um, that documentary, I, I was able to watch the whole entire thing. And um, we'll put a link up on the one book blog so that in your time you can watch the whole entire documentary. I'd like to know what made you just basically do this and what was, you know, and, and, and how did you get started and the whole process? I want to say until about the beginning of this semester, a lot of what I've done is because of my parents. It's been mostly my mom saying, do this, and me saying, OK. <laughs> um, my dad, he said, we're going to Pakistan. We're going to this orphanage. Um, let's do this documentary. I said, OK, let's do it. We went in with the first thing, if you plan on making a documentary, never go into that documentary with a written plan of what you're going to do, because you're going to realize nothing goes your way. We, we had all our equipment, we had all the plans we were going to go, we were going to see, we are going to live in the orphanage for a week and document the kids, really get to know the kids. And then we got to the doors of the orphanage and they say, oh, well, good you're here, we're closing next, uh, they were closing in about two days to go on winter break. We're like, okay. Um, so we stayed at the orphanage. I know a lot of the documentary, it kind of seemed a bit choppy. And it was. It was my first documentary. And we just went with the flow. We, were, we had a few kids with us. And we were just following their daily lives. And they were really excited to have us there. They had the whole room ex in, uh, inspection. And a lot of these kids, there's 200 of the kids in the male orphanage, about 80 girls in the female orphanage. And all of them are orphanage orphans in the sense that they either have one or no parents. Usually their father's passed away and because they've been sent to this orphanage because their family cannot afford to feed about four or five kids without a father there. So a lot of these kids have no father but they have a mother and a home to go to. So there's a boarding school of, of some, uh, like some sorts to them. But a lot of the kids there were actual orphans affected by the earthquakes in 05, the flooding in, uh, in 2010 and the there was a Taliban insurgency there uh, a few months earlier where a lot of the kids' parents were caught in the crossfire. And even some kids in the beginning, when he, the mom of Ali, he was talking about the orphanage, they were actually caught in the middle of a crossfire between the Pakistan army and the Taliban. So they had to evacuate, walk 60 kilometers to a neighboring city and refuge there for a little bit. So these kids have been through a lot, but they're some of the brightest kids in that region. And that region being Swath Valley, where Malala's from. Malala's actually from that town. Muhammad Ali is, was her mentor for the longest time. And we just went, we documented what we could. And the documentary, that was only a small segment of it. The whole documentary itself is an introspective journey throughout Pakistan. I go to Karachi. I lived in Karachi for a while. I went to school there. I went to middle school there. And this is a region that I've never been to. So if you get a chance to see the documentary, you'll see the orphanage. Then traveling through northern Pakistan, we see a Kalashi va uh, village, which is a village of 4,000 pagans in kind of residing in a valley that's surrounded by Taliban. And they're projected to die out in the next 10, 20 years because of the Taliban pressure in the valley. But which is unfortunate because even though they are pagans, like their religion itself is beautiful. They're beautiful people, all very educated people. The, everyone that we met had a master's of some sort, which is crazy to think in a valley miles and miles away from proper civilization or proper universities. They were all highly educated people. And then we went to Lahore, which is a place that I've been to a few times, but I got to see in a different light. And it's a very naive, it's a very introspective journey throughout Pakistan. Um, and if you had a chance to see it, I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Musa, would you be talk a little bit more about your work when you go over there? And, and again, like I, obviously you were, um, your mother probably got you involved, but 
more of the conditions. Um, your son had said something about a pair of sneakers costs more than educating, feeding, clothing. I mean, I think when you said that, Hamza, I think that registered with us more. Could you just elaborate more on that? Um, well, firstly, when I teach my medical students at Kent Hospital, um, my opening lecture is that you have you have more than 99% of the entire planet right now on you, meaning the, the shoes, the watch, the car, the clothes, the books, your $300,000 debt, all that <laughs> is, is really more than 99% of the planet uh, they can ever imagine. So you must, you must, and you don't have to go to Pakistan or India or Africa to, to experience the poverty. You can just go down to Georgia or even North Providence, some part of the Providence behind Rhode Island Hospital. There's some seriously indigenous population there. So, so first of all, I must insist that you have more than what you need guaranteed. Uh, now, if you go to places like where I like to go and work, one dollar right now is equal to about 102 rupees or something like that today. Uh, the buying power of one dollar compared to one rupee is that you can have a full bread, um, baked oven pita bread for five rupees. That's one fifth. One, f uh, what, one five, cents. F five cents for five cents. So the food basically is basic food is rather cheap. Living is very expensive. However, the way uh, they have structured in these orphanages that I worked, uh, this was Akhbal Kor, meaning your own home in Swat, where Malala was from. The other orphanages I, uh, I went like. 15 days ago was the SOS village outside uh, Mansera, um, which is part of the global village of SOS, if you've ever uh, Googled SOS village. So what a wonderful project they have. The, it takes about $50, $60 tops to educate, feed, clothe, board and lodge, one child per month in Pakistan, $50. So um, how they do it, I have no idea. But the cost of living at that level is, uh, is not that much. You have, to make, you have to understand that you have to clean out all the other garbage that we actually try to own. We want it, but we, don't, we want to have it, but we really don't need it. So they go down to bare essentials. And when you have bare essentials, what that is, like three times food, a roof over your head, a nice clean accommodation, and a school, shoes, and friends. And that's all basically what you need. So that's, that, that's about what it takes. Now, you were looking at that gentleman, Muhammad Ali, who was the principal of the uh, school there at Hamza did the documentary of his principle is very simple, is that if my child cannot study in this school, if my child cannot eat the same food, and if my child cannot sleep here, then no other child shall do that too. So there are people who are extremely motivated, selfless, dedicated, and honest people that are doing such work. Even in SOS Village that I saw, I mean, like, I have my own slideshow, but we don't have time for that. And you see these kids, their eyes, their eyes can tell whether they're happy or not. And you look into their eyes, and you see them happy. And all they have is they don't have iPhones or iPads or whatever else you guys have nowadays. Um, no sneakers, uh, no three pair of jeans, none of that stuff. Uh, but they have each other, and they're happy. And the people take care of them. So, you know. So what I do basically is um, 
I try to find organizations at grassroots that have good penetration in the community that have that can find out places for me that could be center point where I could get patients there for their evaluations. And then um, I set up a plan and I fundraise and then I go to Pakistan and you know take the leap of faith and hope, hope that nothing will happen. And you know, uh, we do a good job. So between the two camps that in the past two years I've done, I've seen more than 6,000 patients. Uh, and, and that's a decent number. Right? 6,000 people, lives touch one way or the other. And it's not just my thing. I mean, like, it's more to do with my wife who supports me and the people who fund it. But more importantly, the people at the ground level who are organizing all this getting the cars, the transportation, like Tharparka, Rajasthan Desert is like, I kid you not, if my, I insisted, being the team leader, I insisted that our caravan of vehicles should not break, because if it breaks and the last car, for some reason, breaks down, you cannot possibly find it for whenever. It gets hot during the daytime. Same happens over here, that if, if, if your cars are not following the path and the mountain region, there's a ditch is there that if it goes off the curb a bit too fast, it's gone. See ya, bye. So it's dangerous territory. But these are the drivers who drive there, the volunteers who get us there, the, the people who get the pharmacy going over there. I don't know how they make it happen, but they make it happen. So it's not me, it's the people down there. I just fund it, fund it. And there are lots of people over here who are willing to fund such things. I just happen to just take it there. Dr. Bakhtiri, as you know, Malala just recently won the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, we're honored to see that you have also been a Nobel Peace nominee. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and your um, Institute of Development Studies, which, as I understand, is a learning institute for young people. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> uh, the, well, my nomination is uh, not uh, really in the same line as Malala's. But uh, what happened was that um, uh, globally there's a movement that peace does not come by one person. So women uh, across the globe have been struggling for a long time that uh, a role of women in peace and lots of women together bring peace. So this is a, a kind of a struggle. Uh, so they wanted to have about 20 or 25 women from each country uh, to represent that so many women can be nominated. So it was like a more of a symbolic, <laughs> not that heroic, as heroic as Malala's. Uh, what, uh, um, what uh, we have been engaged in, uh, in Balochistan basically, m our, my focus is, because it, this is a province which is uh, least uh, developed, has not been mainstream in the development process of the country, and is uh, mainly because it is uh, very thinly populated with a huge mass of land and mountains and deserts. So it doesn't catch that much attention of the politicians. Uh, but it is very tribal, very much uh, uh, rooted, and very hardcore, um, you know, mountainous people uh, who, who really, uh, when you meet them and you, when you live with them, you feel that you are in, in the 14th century or 15th century, but it's beautiful. And their traditions, their way of doing things, and their way of understanding life is so uh, maybe raw, but very natural and very... Uh, much uh, connecting with the people and the nature. So here it was, the challenge with the government of that province was that uh, no girls' schools were there uh, when I entered there. And I was called in by the government that if I can help them out in, in promoting girls' education and to help establish girls' schools. So uh, my role was basically to um, go out village to village. And those days, it was like 20,000 villages. 
uh, and hamlets, small, small, uh, you know, 10, 15 houses together is also called village there. And uh, I went across uh, with a team uh, to find out what are the obstacles in girls' education. What is it that is not really letting girls' schools being established in this province? And uh, I went around, uh, around 4,000 villages myself personally. And interestingly, whenever I talked about school and girls' education with the community, with the men, women, elders, so, uh, tribal chiefs, not a single person was against girls' education. Not a single man or a woman of any state opposed uh, girls' education. And they immediately offered their land, their place, their home. But there were no girls' teachers. <coughs> so what do we do that then? There were no uh, women to become teachers in the villages because there have never been girls' schools, so there are no girls, girls who are 10th grader, minimum 10th grader or 8th grader to start the school. So when, we, so when I entered each and every house in those 4,000 villages, surprisingly, I discovered more than 2,000 girls in those homes with 10th grade or 8th grade education. And I was so surprised. I said, but how come you got this education from where? What they did was their elders, their, their fathers, their, uh, their uncles, their grandfathers, their brothers, their cousins who were teaching in boys' schools, they got these, they, uh, they coached their, uh, these girls at home. They used to bring the slavers from the boys' school and taught these girls at home. And whenever the time came for examination, they got them enrolled in their own schools as boys, as name under the boys' name. And they changed their names for that moment to be to so that they can give the exams. So in the in the center of the education department, naturally there were no names of the girls from those schools who have, who have eight to ten grader. They were all boys under the boys' names. This demonstrated so strongly to me, uh, uh, myself coming from urban Karachi, where we, we stand with a slogan that only we know education and we, we value education. And it was just a, such a slap on my face that look how desperate they are for girls' education. And what they have done according to, to their own sense, whatever was possible, they did it. And, and within first six months, I discovered 2,500 young girls to start schools. So we established uh, more than 2,200 girls' schools in less than five years across the province with, uh, with these, uh, these uh, girls uh, in the villages. The government of Balochistan came forward and they gave home, uh, they constructed the, uh, the school buildings, they provided the material they get started giving the salaries to these girls, and they took them on as their own government school teachers. We had to fight for lowering their education level to hire a teacher, and also the age. So wherever a, a, a woman who has crossed her service age can be employed if she belongs to that is village. And a girl as young as 14 or 15 or 16 can be hired as a teacher, because that's, a, that's the situation. So the policies had to be shifted. And that's what, uh, where uh, whatever experience I have comes in to how to create policies according to the people's need and then grow from there and raise the standards uh, eventually. So this was, the, these are the lessons and uh, wonderful lessons that we learned and it gave such a great hope that we created a whole institute of studies and practices with the people of the country. And now we have got about more than 6,000 graduates who are all uh, youth, young people. And they, are, they went through our courses in community development. What I've just narrated, these are long stories and there's a sh uh, shortage of time. And those courses, takes, we take our young people through those courses and they then come into as community activists in, in the field of uh, uh, water, sanitation, schools, uh, human rights, uh, child rights, um, early childhood development, midwives, dress designing courses, 
uh, you name it, and it's like uh, everything uh, these young people are being, uh, uh, they are taking up the, as their career, who could not uh, go into regular government schools because of their low standards or their lower grades. So we compensate for that, and we, uh, our institutes take them on and bring them back in the, in the mainstream of, the, of their livelihood and education. Uh, the other area is that uh, we try to protect the youth of Pakistan because of what is prevailing across the country. The vested interest is after the youth of the country. And because of the high inflation and because of high, high employment and poor education, so these are like sitting ducks. Uh, anybody can hire them, pay them a few bucks and get whatever they want. So this is another area right now is a challenge for us to divert the government policies into this, into this area and to focus the huge young population who is right now outside the system of education and livelihood, formal education. And we have demonstrated a model that how even excluded young people can be mainstreamed even though they don't have the right credentials or they don't have those standards. And it is really fun, uh, working well. The, right, uh, the government of Balochistan gave us four acres of land to construct an institute. And the community built it up with their own uh, technology of mud structure. The way people live, so is our university or, uh, or institute is. It's, it's just wonderful and beautiful. And that is where it becomes like we, we are connecting with the rest of the country. And we connected with Swat, we connected with uh, Rajasthan, because all over, the, all over the country, we have our graduates now. And uh, we can start any development program anywhere in the country without really uh, having a lot of money or infrastructure or a office or an institute or cars running around here and there or offices. It's the individual that goes out and does things for their own people, the young people, whose he or she gets connected through our courses, coursework, by his own inner self, with his own immediate family. The family protection has to come to, to protect them from the streets, the violence on the streets, the outside culture that takes away the children to do all the wrong things. So we are getting more family support to take care of their own uh, children. Then we have a lot of parenting. And then community development comes in. And from there, we, uh, we teach them computers and on the net, internet, so they can be connected globally with all their own kinds in the world, how others are doing in their situation and how other young people are progressing, then why can't they do the same? So these are some uh, examples. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Akhtar, I have to tell you, I, um, as you know, I'm a librarian, so as soon as I saw that you help improve libraries, it just warmed my heart. Um, I'd like to talk, that if you could just talk a little bit more about, um, you know, like, um, we had a student here, Shabazz Khan, who was here earlier, who talked about how, um, how American students, you know, you were always worry about the next generation iPhone or the newest tablet. He says, but back in Pakistan, he's like, we were just happy to have education. Can you just talk a little bit more about some of the, maybe the classes that the students would take and just maybe a day in the life of a student going to school? Um. I mean the, uh, the st I mean I I must say but Pakistan is you know is a is a big country and a lot of people and there are some great institutions there as well like they are here uh, the medical school I went to is a beautiful institution it has a huge hospital associated with 2000 beds hospital and it's a beautiful campus so I'm just saying not every school in Pakistan is like bad so but um, I must say that you don't have to go far to find a school that in desperate need. And um, the reason I started working in school um, close to uh, where my hometown is now is because uh, I have a good friend who is a veterinarian, and um, he went to give a lecture in a school how to raise chicken or something. But he said the headmaster of that school uh, asking if you need anybody uh, who can help us with the desks and benches because we have students sitting on the floor. So when I went there, he told me, and then we went to see the headmaster there, and then we started working with the school. So there are a lot of people who really want to be, uh, the teachers are really good. I mean, they really want to, what is best for their student, like here, you know, the teachers are very good and they want the best. But it's sometimes the resources are so limited that it's almost ironic. 
So for example, I went to this school. I, I saw a nice uh, big room. I said, what is that? He said, that's our computer lab. So I said, but why is it locked? He said, well, well, you know, they built the building, but uh, they ran short in money, so they, they didn't have the electricity. I said, but you have electricity right there? He said, oh, yeah, but they ran short in money. So, they can, so basically, this room has about six computers in it. And they had two computer teachers in the school. They are paid by the government, and they accept collecting salaries, but they're not doing anything because the computer room that was built has no electricity. So uh, I said, well, so that's easy to fix. So I'm just saying, we spent 70,000 rupees, which is about 170 bucks. We put, we, so we got an electrician, got electricity from literally from down to here, and electrify the room, and we put two fans in there, and the computer room came alive. And it's just nice to see, because it's just so easy to do. I mean, simple things like that. So now I bought them 10 additional computers. I have gone and every time I visit and I, I bought over there. So it, because it's so good to see that finally now they have, they're online, they're on, they, they're electric, their computers are working and they're online. So by just for 170 bucks. So, so you know, there are a lot of small stories, but I'm just saying it's just, uh, uh, it's amazing um, that how much difference you can make but very little money. Somebody said, oh, you know, you can't do this work because you need a lot of money. And I, I said, no, 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 no. Actually, people who have done most work in the world actually had no money. And we have an example in Pakistan of uh, Idi. This gentleman has no money, and he has spent billions of dollars because people just come and give him money because he's an honest guy and he does uh, running a huge enterprise in Pakistan. Uh, that includes the ambulances, the largest, the, huh? largest. the largest in the world, actually. Enterprise that is uh, run by him, and he lives in a small house. He had no money to start with. And all money, people just come and donate tremendous amount of money to him. And he runs, as I said, uh, all the ambulance system literally in the Pakistan is run by through his organization. Uh, all the dead are buried through his, who have no, cl no nobody claims that it's buried through him. All the uh, women who are, leave their houses for, uh, for domestic violence or something are hosted by him. He runs a huge orphanage throughout the country. So what I'm saying is uh, uh, the, some of the people who do most work had no money. So, um, so I just say, you know, so I think that's maybe the lesson for everybody is just you know, a lot of nice people here, meaning well-meaning people. And that activism, not only necessary in Pakistan or Africa, it is necessary here too. You know, so we can all use some of it. Um, and, uh, you know, and I say it doesn't take long. It does, it just, uh, I actually, you know, it's a small little story. Uh, when I first wanted to go in 2010, in August, uh, right after the flood, uh, a patient of mine asked me, what are you going to do there? <coughs> I said, I honestly don't know, but I'm just going to go. And, um, and I said, I'm going to bring a bunch of money, and I'm just going to go. She said to me, never underestimate the power of one. And I tell you, never underestimate the power of yourself, so you guys can bring a lot of change. And America is a very powerful country, and, uh, and I think you as American and me, uh, me as American, my kids are American, are very powerful people. So what I suggest to you, you know, let's seek peace and justice in the world, and that brings everything possible, makes everything possible. And not to believe in the media. Yeah, not to believe in the media. Just seek justice, and you guys are very powerful. We all are powerful as people. And uh, we just have to explore, find that power in us. And we all have the ability to do, uh, to, to do what we are doing a little bit. But I'm just saying you all have the, then there's tremendous need in the world. And as my organization, we also have contributed to Ob Ob Ebola fight. We have uh, contributed to Syrian refugees. We have contributed to people, needy people in the United States. So it's just not Pakistan. It's just wherever the need may be you know, why we should be able to help out as people, as people of this planet, not just Americans, but everybody.
Thank you. Um, at this point, does anybody have any questions for any one of the panelists? Anybody like to ask a question? I can come to you with my microphone. Anybody could have question? Yep, hold on a sec. Okay, sure, we'll come back to you. Sure. Thank you, thank you for that wonderful information and for being so inspirational. Um, I wanted to know uh, if at all during the work that you were doing when you got started or as you were doing it, if you ever felt like giving up and what was it that motivated you that to keep going? Because I'm sure there were obstacles along the way. I mean, uh, what motivates is uh, when I saw those kids uh, going around without much clothes and had no place to stay, no house to live in, and I thought they looked no different from my kids, really. And I said, you know, uh, that's not fair. So, so I think what motivates is my, when I look at my kids and how much they have in here and how much other people don't have. So just uh, this, just the you know, I, my main purpose of the foundation, if I were to put it in few words, is work for the kids. So that's how I have focus on. Uh, but that's my offer. I mean, just saying, you know, there there are different ways you can do this task. But I, when I look at my kids, and I say, so, you know, and he has this, 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 and well, he has a house, so we gotta build a house. So we did that, and I. And now you suddenly you say, you can, you're able to do that, you know? And it's amazing, Pakistan is amazing, because you can actually, there is very little lead tape. When you have money, you can just make things happen very quickly, you know? So uh, then we say, well, let's work on the school. And that school is transformed by very little money. And, and the, uh, by just doing that, the school enrollment has increased. You know, like we used to, now it's 100 and, uh, 135 students in the same school. And there's another school, I, a girls' school I work in, Faisalabad area. And uh, the schools has, uh, they, I went to, uh, uh, there's a uh, madam we, where I work with, uh, and she said, there is a student, uh, it's a, it has a girls' school, but it's small boys go there too. This boy, it has no money for uniform. So every day, the teacher reminds, you gotta have uniform, you know what I'm just saying. So, I mean, I mean this, Guy would look beat up because he didn't have uniform, and it cost me 600 rupees to buy him two uniform, which is six dollars. You know, is this so so much easy sometimes? So we say, I ask teacher, what do they need? They say they need uniform. I am against uniform, but I am against you know doing temporary things that are you know I like to see substantial things, build something, but you know uniforms are very important. I said we we'll do that. So we gave everybody in the school uniform. So we bought everybody uniform. And you know what? The enrollment has increased from 350 students on that school. Now it's like 425. Oh, so this school gives uniform, gives clothes too. So let's enroll our kids there. So I'm just saying simple things can make a big difference. Now I, have th I was just talking to Madam the other day. I said, now I'm gonna go next month. So I'm gonna say, make a list of the students. Who, they said, there's some students come without shoes. So we're gonna buy them shoes. So it's, it doesn't take a lot. I mean, just, you know, it just, and it, it really develops the school per se, because school enrollment has increased. So this is how, I mean, there are difficulty always. But I enjoy this work so much because I see the smiles on the kids' faces. And uh, you know, so I never been a dull moment. There have been times I've been discouraged, like when I used to travel six hours one way and six hours one way to 12 hours just to get there, or get on back. And then we used to stay there two, three hours and do the work. 
that was exhausting. But I'm just saying, but it, it is worthwhile work, and anybody can do it. And I assure you, it is in you, all of you, to do it at a smaller scale or a bigger scale. And as I said, America is a very powerful country. You guys are going to be in different positions of power. Make sure your people are no different. They may live, look, live in other countries. They speak another language. They dress differently, but the kids are really the same and people are the same. Let's more make sure we, we look out for each other and do things that are good for everybody. Sorry, did I answer the question? <laughs> well, I don't know if this is a question more of this acclimate for everybody on the panel, but individually, I, I look at you all and I see individual strength and, you know, as a family, that's where um, that you would go across the waters into an, another place just to help other people, although they may be the same as you. And I hear you all, all mentioning that, you know, what well, everyone you know deserves and should feel like they're loved and cared for. My concern is like um, humanitarian. Um, we, as people, we all need to be more humanitarian and try to help one another. And I, f I feel like coming across to, you know, from you all there. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, when, you, when you first visioned this, <laughs> I mean, if you can go back that far, when you first visioned it, uh, did you ever think that it would co you know, come out to you know, doing speaking uh, at, at universities all, all over the world even? So anyone on the panel? Um, I can definitely speak towards that. Um, I'm only like 19, I'm a sophomore in college. I never thought I'd be here. I'm lucky to have the, um, the support group that I have from my parents who they know. Um, actually, I was invited here because I was at an Eve dinner and my mother was talking to some, uh, I think she's a teacher here, and she said, she was talking about my documentary and they said like, she was very, she was like, that's interesting, I'd love to talk to him. So. I'm lucky enough to have those connections. <clears throat> and as someone who wants to work as a humanitarian, I want to work in public health. Um, I'm working, getting my degree in uh, public policy and a minor in uh, healthcare administration. I want to do all these things after college. I want to work for NGO. I want to work for the government. I want to help as many people as I can. But it is hard. I know. I was doing a fundraiser Monday night for the orphanage. It was through the Pakistani community of Yukon. And I was texting all my friends and like, hey, come on, come to this fundraiser. It's only $5. It goes towards these kids. Uh, it goes towards these kids. And you'll find that not as many people are as inspired as you. Not as many people want to make the same different difference in the world as you. And that's hard. It, it is hard. I know I was, when I was talking to my friends, I was talking to them today or yesterday, I'm saying I'm coming to Bristol Community College to give the speech to panelists on um, Malala. They're like, who's Malala? That like educated kids asked, who's Malala? And that's a bit discouraging because you, you, see, you see all these problems, you want to make a difference, and you realize that people are very comfortable with it where they are. They aren't willing to go above and beyond. Um, I'm lucky to have the father, mother, and the grandmother that I do to know, say, um, to know the people that I do that inspire me on a daily basis to make me not ride the coattails of my parents. Like, from, like I've been riding my parents' coattails for the longest time, but now because of all these people that I've met, the, like, the adventures that I've been on, the experience that I've had, um, I have the ability to be accountable for myself and become an inspiration for other people. And it is, I know it's hard. I know, I'm sure many of you people are here because you want to make a difference. Um, it is hard, but don't be discouraged because then you end up to be like my grandmother who went through as much adversity in the world. And now she's not only talking here, she's talking all around the world, giving speeches to a lot of people. She worked for UNICEF. She's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And I would just say keep, like, just keep grinding, just keep, the struggle's real, but, you know, you just got to keep pushing. And just um, when you work with people who have nothing, you tend to realize 
that it is your, you are not important. They are important. If you work genuinely with them, so very soon, if you keep on doing it, you stop worrying about your own personal projection. It, it becomes very important that you deliver to them and you forget that well, whether I'm going to be getting nominated for Nobel Prize or whether, I, whether I'll be going to give a lecture here or there, you very soon forget all that and you just get focused on, okay, this is my next project. Let's get on with that. And then that's my next project. These opportunities come, if they come, if they don't come, it will not stop me from doing what I need to do. We have time for like one more question. Does anybody have a question? Yep. Hi. Is, is the threat of attacks against schools in Pakistan, is it still as big of a threat as it, as it was, or is it, is it getting better? Uh, as I said, um, I doubt what media tells you. Uh, right now, Pakistan is uh, going through, like, officially it is not declared, but insurgency. And uh, uh, the vested interest is attacking all those institutions which is run by the government or which is promoted by, uh, by the civilized world. Uh, it's not girls' education, but the, but the school is a symbol of, uh, uh, of, a, of, uh, of a government institution, of a power that they, they, are, they want to attack. They want to attack banks. It's not only schools. Banks, railway stations, airports. So, uh, for example, um, in Balochistan, which is very tribal, which is very uh, uh, same, if you want to say, where the schools are being attacked. Not a single school, girls' school, have been attacked. Not a single school ha have been blown up in that province because that province is still not in the mainstream no stream of all that's happening. But again, there were one or two uh, boys' or girls' schools who were blown up by the separatists who, who are fighting with the government. So it is, the schools are a very soft target. They're out in the vulnerable, vulnerable um, wilderness. They are not protected. They're, it's government building. Most of the time, there are no children in the schools. So they targeted uh, to give a message to the government that they're fighting against, that uh, it is how they feel. But it is not really against girls' education. It's against government institutions because of the way the situations are. Is. Um, uh, sometimes it is, yes, there are uh, areas, places, or people who, are, who do say that um, we don't want girls' education, but that is a very, very small minority now in Pakistan. It is no more. You talk to the parents, you talk to the ordinary people, they're desperate for education. You, you heard him say, uh, we established in less than five years 2,200 girls' schools. In less than five years, 300,000 girls were enrolled in it by the community, by the parents. Never in the history it has happened. So it's, it's all uh, very confused messages that, that is coming from that part of the world. If you want to add. I just wanted to add something. But, I mean, there is no... Uh, um, the, no, nobody against girls' education uh, that I know or uh, a, a, that we grew up. There's no, there's no doubt. There's no con conflict between girls' education. Our prime minister, we had a woman prime minister twice in Pakistan. Not here. Hasn't happened in the United States yet. You know, so it's not, um, we have tons of physicians. We have more women physicians now than men physicians coming out of medical colleges. So there is no conflict with girls' education. Yeah, you know, so it, this is not in doubt. This, um, this Taliban is a uh, torture for our country created by external forces. If you read Malala's book, she says that in that. Uh, if you re actually read it, you know, these Taliban were created to fight Cold War. 
you know, with the help of the United States, with the help of Saudi Arabia and Pakistan military. Three, three, uh, three um, uh, forces joined together to create Mujahideen that fought uh, Russia in Afghanistan to win the Cold War. And they are remnant left over from that. This is an aberrancy. This is absolutely not the mainstream. Uh, so, but as far as uh, ideology, do uh, Pakistan or Pakistan people are against women? They're absolutely not. You know, this uh, Taliban is, uh, you know, is a residual uh, from that era, and you know. So I think uh, hopefully it fades. They, they, they don't represent Pakistan. Pakistan. They don't represent Pakistan people. They don't. They were created they by outside. external yeah. forces. As I said there were three forces in Pakistan military. Uh, with ISI and um, uh, Saudi money and United States support, military and, and financial support, created this Taliban. So the, they were originally they were called Mujahideen. And now when the uh, United States won the Cold War, United States left, they become, they saw, we, they got a gun, these people who were, were they're, uh, now they got a gun. So now they are terrorizing people. So this is uh, a philosophy not... Uh, uh, is not uh, is not a Pakistani uh, if I if I could really add in it I asked several times for, from the media to document this this educational work that communities are doing that people are doing the, the television doesn't have any time for them they all the time who have been interviewed are the ones who have a voice who, who represent a political party who represent a uh, uh, point of view of uh, of some uh, leaders or some uh, ideology, but ordinary people never get time at the media to ex to say what they are doing, what they want. They never get any access to the to the media. If only they can come and speak, then only you will know what what real actual Pakistanis are, what what the ordinary people are of Pakistan, which are majority. But the media doesn't cover the good stories, the positive uh, breakthroughs, the way communities, uh, huge communities resisted when a, when a woman lady doctor was kidnapped by these Taliban. Uh, whole Pashin community is where, where we work. Just no forces, no police, no army. The people themselves fought with them. With them. And, and got the lady doctor uh, recovered and finished them all by themselves. The ordinary people did it. The way the, 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 the people of Pakistan are standing up against these resistance without any support uh, from, uh, because they are just people. When, when their community or somebody is attacked, they have to just come and, I mean, they're not prepared like a soldier or something. But everywhere, uh, the ordinary people are making a big difference. And this is how we are all uh, still surviving and growing. Uh, Pakistan is a very misunderstood country at the moment, and we have to really find out the f what is truth, and what is real, and what is being told. It's it's really um, unfortunate, very unfortunate these days. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the One Book Committee would personally like to thank Farah Habib for uh, helping us put together this panel. Without her, this wouldn't have been possible. We'd also like to personally thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come here and talk to us. I mean, I wish we had more time, because I could go on forever. I have a bazillion questions I'd like to ask. But um, again, thank you very much. Please refer back to the One Book blog or our Facebook page. We'll have links up to the full documentary. And if you could share your presentation with us, we'd be more than happy to share that as well. So uh, thank you. Give them a big round of applause.